for that. Today's message has a reminder for you that you are a vital, important part of the Christmas theme, the Christmas narrative, the Christmas message. I don't know if you've thought of it before, but we're going to focus on an aspect of your part in taking the good news of Jesus' birth to the world that maybe you haven't realized before. But before we do that, before we jump in, before we remind you of some good news from Scripture, could you bow your heads with me for prayer? Father, you are a good God. And this time of year, we are reminded especially of your love for us, that you loved us so much you gave us a present in the form of Jesus, your Son. Father, thank you for that. Lord, as we spend some time together today opening your word, would you please bless us with your spirit? Would you please let your angels draw near? Would you please tune our hearts to hear your voice? Father, we love you. We sure miss you. And Lord, as, as this little world has gotten darker this year, we thank you for the light that we have in Jesus and the gift of this child that, that has come to save us all. Father, we thank you again, and we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So today's message is entitled, There Are Still Angels. And the account that we're going to look at is Dr. Luke's account. And I don't know how many of you get the opportunity each year, around this time of year, to drop into the New Testament and look at the different narratives, the different historical accounts of Jesus' birth. The miraculous things that happen there, it's a, it's a neat thing to do. It's faith giving, it's faith restoring. If you have children or grandchildren especially, I remember as a boy my parents would read these narratives to us at this time of year and it was this annual reminder that you were loved, that you were important to God, that you were, you were an incredibly desired part of his kingdom. It's a neat time to be reminded of that, isn't it? In case you were wondering at the end of the year, if you got beat up a little bit, do I matter? Am I valued? This service today, this section of text we're going to look at, will say with arms open wide, you are important to God. And you have a vital part to play in the finishing work before Jesus returns. So let's open scripture. We're going to explore from Dr. Luke's account. And you know Dr. Luke, he has all the details. If you read Luke Acts, you understand why Jesus came and what he was doing here and how the early church started to work and what their mission was. And Dr. Luke's account is one of the most detailed accounts of the birth of Jesus and the events surrounding it. So we're going to read, we're going to read through some of those verses and then we're going to take it apart and we're going to look at some of what he says. So we'll start with Luke chapter 2, verse 1. It came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. The census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria. Do you see how Dr. Luke throws in all these things that you really need a history book to go check? He's got details. He, he, was, a, he was a person who loved the facts. Continue, so all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house of and lineage of David. To be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. She brought forth her firstborn son, wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. If we pause there, can you imagine the king of heaven? Wouldn't you think when an important person comes to your town, that they're going to look for a nice place to stay, a place that is usually equal to their rank or their situation in life. Maybe they would stay with friends. Oftentimes they would stay in the best place they could find. But here comes your Savior and mine, your Creator and mine, the King of the universe, and the only place he can find in the city is out with the animals. And he was willing to do it. That's the incredible part. He was willing to do that. Hey, if, if this is what it takes so that I can come and I can redeem my children, of course I'm going to do it. Luke continues. There were in the same country shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Friends, when's the last time you had an angel show up 
and decided they needed to share something with you. I have not had it either. But every, it seems like every time they show up, or very frequently in the Bible, our first reaction is fear. It's that old Genesis chapter 3 response. When we separated and rebelled against God, we've just been hiding ever since. And the shepherds are afraid. This bright glory is shining there. But listen to what the angel tells them. Do not be afraid. For behold, or look, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. There is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. Suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill to men. How's that for a choir? Can you imagine there those angelic hosts that are there to sing and celebrate the birth of our Savior, waiting with eagerness for their turn. You know that first angel that was taking his time, telling them, you know, don't be afraid. If I was the other angel, I'd be thinking, hurry up. We've got a song to sing. We have something to say. And they do. Glory to God in the highest. On earth, peace, goodwill to men. Is that a good message for our time? For those of us who have wondered what's heaven's attitude toward us this year, and all my mistakes and all my slip-ups and all the things I mess up in, what is heaven's approach to me? And it's still this mercy-filled message. Peace, goodwill to you. That's a good thing to be reminded of during the Christmas season. What is God's attitude toward me? Peace and goodwill. So it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. They came with haste. They found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. When they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child, and all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. What would your response have been if a shepherd came to you just knocking on your door that night? Hey, we just saw angels. And they said the Messiah has been born. And they told us where to find him. And we found him. And there he was. And moreover, they said that God's attitude was peace toward us and goodwill to us. Would your heart have leapt? Would you have been excited? I hope so. From this narrative, I want to, to remind us of the value of sharing good news. These angels came from the throne of heaven with a message of good news, and they didn't bring it to the kings of the world, and they didn't bring it to the priests. They didn't go visit the temple. They didn't go to the Sadducees or the Pharisees. They did not go to the educated. Where did they go? The shepherds. They went to where people were thirsting for an understanding. The Old Testament says the water will be poured out on those who thirst. And these shepherds must have been out there considering the fact that Daniel's prophecies about the birth of the Messiah were the time was near. That the Messiah's advent was, it was coming. They're in the ballpark to bear good news to these people. Expecting good news would have been exciting. When's the last time you took good news to someone? If, if you had some good news, whether it was for a child, a grandchild, a peer, a loved one, in this community uh, this last year, someone called me. It was a delight. And they said, hey, pastor, uh, we've decided that we would like to give our uh, stimulus check to another family. Do you know how much fun it was for me to go find another family that was really needing that? I was just bubbling as I was out there exploring because I knew that the news that I had to bring to some family out there somewhere was incredibly positive. God wants you to understand from this text, and we're going to explore that, that you have such exciting news for someone out there that you can be bubbling, you can be excited, you can be full of excitement about how to share about Jesus. Because our world today has all the elements of this nighttime scene that we just read in Dr. Luke's account. Our world today still has shepherds. Now the shepherds today, we could have put that in quotation marks, your shepherds today in this community, we don't have a lot of flocks of sheep, do we? So let's take the basics. 
The shepherds were the hardworking men and women. They were out there 24-7, 365, doing their part to put bread on the table, pay their bills, provide for their families. Do we still have those kind of people in our community? We are still those people, aren't we? We are still, whether we're retired or we're just starting our careers, whether we are somewhere younger in years or advanced in years, we're the doctors, the dentists, the lawyers, the mechanics. We're the people that are teaching or educating or working or serving this community. We still have people that could use good news. There are still shepherds, if you will. And it is still night. Heaven, when heaven looks at us, sees our condition on this little planet, this little blue sphere, as darkness. It is still night. Let's remind ourselves very quickly of this darkness, light imagery that God uses with us. Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2 says, By the way of the sea beyond Jordan, in Galilee of the Gentiles. And as soon as you hear that, you remember that this is one of those old prophecies about Jesus. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death upon them, light has shined. Who specifically is this old text talking about? Jesus, isn't it? That he's going to come and he's going to shine light onto mankind. John tells us a little bit more, this light and darkness. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was what? The light of men. So life is, is being, there's this parallel being drawn between having life and having light. That light is life. John continues, the light shines in the darkness. The darkness did not comprehend it. Then he switches for a second to talk about John the Baptist. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. This man came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of the light. That, and now he's talking about Jesus specifically, was the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. Do you see how Scripture shows our little world as just darkness. Apart from God, it's dark. And with God, it's light. Apart from God, we die. But with God, we are alive. John later on records Jesus saying these words. Jesus spoke to them again saying, this is John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but he will have the light of what? The light of life. Again, this world is darkness and death, but Jesus is light and life. This child laying in a manger that these shepherds have come to see and then talk about, he is life to the world. John three sixteen and 17 and beyond shows us something as well. You know the first part well. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's a little longer than you and I have right now, isn't it? God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him, John continues, recording Jesus' words, is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the condemnation. Light has come into the world. Men love darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. So again, God uses this imagery of darkness and light to show us that where we are is dark and where he is is light. And he's come to show us the way back to himself so that we might live forever. So we still have shepherds. The world is still dark. And his birth is still good tidings of great joy to all people. This year was a doozy, wasn't it? 2020, you take COVID and the election and the unrest in the United States, and this world could really use some good news. Our nation could use good news. We could use good news. So let us be reminded, not only by Dr. Luke, but let's look at some other aspects that Jesus' birth, some other things that Jesus' birth does for us that are good news that we could be reminded of and share. Matthew 1.21. She, who is she? 
That's Mary, isn't it? She will bring forth a son. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Man, you know yourself well. You know your history, and I don't know it. And I know my history, and you don't know it. But each of us knows that we've had a broken road behind us. We aren't like God yet. We're trying to be faithful. We're partnering with the Holy Spirit, but we sure keep falling on our faces. And Jesus has come so that he can take his perfect life and offer it in place of your messed up life and my messed up life. He can offer life in place of the death that we experience. That he loves us enough to save us from the very things that separate us from him. And that's a very good thing. John 5, 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has what? Everlasting life. And shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Friends, you and, you and I know that we're going to fall asleep at some point. If Jesus doesn't return soon, all of us will fall asleep. But praise the Lord for the hope that we have in Jesus. That death is not the end for us. We're not forever separated from our loved ones. We're not forever separated from God. That he wanted us to live and live forever. In giving us Jesus, he's given us life. That's good news. 2 Corinthians 5.21 He made him, that's God, made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Can you imagine heaven looking at you and seeing only someone holy, harmless, and undefiled? Can you imagine the inhabitants of that vast universe outside of our little solar system that has never sinned and never rebelled and when they look at you because of what Jesus has done, they only see beauty and they only see loyalty. Second Corinthians, Paul is telling us that Jesus became sin so that he could offer us his life in place of ours. So that when heaven looks at us, they just see another child of God. A second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance. Paul writes in Acts, they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm sorry, Dr. Luke writes in Acts. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. How complex does it get? Isn't that simple? To see Jesus, to observe, to learn about him, to see that he is loving and kind and merciful and gracious, and then to say, I'd like to accept him as my Lord. And the disciples are here saying, if you make that decision, you will be saved and your household. Heaven did not want salvation to be complex. It was supposed to be as simple as it can get so that we who have fallen can easily find our way home and easily be reunited with God. That simplicity is highlighted in Acts 4.12, the beauty, this good news that we can take to the world. Nor is there salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. I don't know what laundry detergent you use but I bet it's different than mine. Or the cars you drive or the clothes you wear or the place you live. We all live in different places. We all have multiple choices. Shopping can get complex sometimes. Making a purchase can be immensely stressful because of all the options sometimes. But God made salvation very simple. One option. You don't have to go looking beyond Jesus. It's not complex he is the child that was born to be king and to redeem you and me. And that's the only place you need to look for salvation. You can rest that your search is over because he's the one, the author of that salvation. One name. Titus, the grace of God brings salvation, has appeared to how many people? All men. Friends, this was for you and your family your friends, your circle of influence. It was for all of mankind. It's, it's not just for a denomination. It's not just for a nation. It's for every descendant of Adam. You and I and all the other humanity on this broad sphere, all invited to have eternal life. Jesus came. No wonder the angels could tell those shepherds that Jesus came. This was going to be good news of great joy not just to Israel, but to all people. Hebrews 9.28, So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin 
for salvation. Friends, the best is yet to come. This world is getting darker and more messed up. We continue to drift morally downward and downward. And yet, the best is yet to come because Christ is returning. He had a first advent when he came as a, as a human, a baby. He grew and he lived and he died and rose again. And then he's been in heaven preparing a place for you. Almost 2,000 years now. Soon to be 2,000 years. He's preparing a place just for you. And Hebrews promises that part of the good news for all mankind is that that return is certain. He hasn't forgotten you. You're on his mind every day. Every time he looks at his hands and he sees those prints, he's reminded of your value and the fact that he's returning for you. Romans 1.16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. All of the world is invited. In all of our brokenness, in all of our messed up, with all of our addictions and all of our sins, we're all invited closer to our Heavenly Father. We're all invited into the kingdom. The babe who comes, the babe who those shepherds go and see, has come to invite every man and every woman into the kingdom. Romans 5, 7, and 8 reminds us, For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Now you could, you could take the last part of that and say, while we were still rebellious, while we didn't want anything to do with God, while we were completely addicted and completely sinful and completely broken, he still loved us and still valued us and still said, of course I'll go try to save them. Of course I'll show up in a manger because they're worth it. They're my kids. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Friends, he calls us broken as we are, and he doesn't leave us that way. But he invites every single one of us to be with him and near him. There's room for you in the kingdom, and he wants you there. John 3, 16 and 17 again. Because this Christmas season, if you can remember God's great love for you, it will carry away much of the weight of this last year. To remember that you are important enough to come and live and die for does something in your heart to lift the weight of what the year can try to put on you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. Friends, is this the picture of God you and I present to people? If we are like the shepherds and we're running off into the world to share the picture of God and of this beautiful baby that has been born to save all of mankind, is this the picture that we share? A God who did not come to condemn, but to save. Do we start with the love of God when we talk about him? Do we start with his mercy and his grace? Do we start where he started? Moses said, show me your glory. And when Jesus, when that pre-incarnate Jesus walked past him, you remember what he said. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful. That's how God started his own self-introduction. Do we start there? merciful because friends if our picture of God is that merciful picture of God during this holiday season certainly the world could use a hopeful picture of God a merciful God to say it's okay to be broken I'll fix that just come as you are there are still angels so there are still shepherds the world is still dark the news is still good news and and there are still angels and this is something I would like to remind you of your value, of your part to play in this amazing Christmas account. This is the word in Greek, agalos or angelos, depending on how you want to say that. It's simply a messenger or one who is sent. Now, often in the New Testament, when it is clear that the being being sent is not from planet Earth, they translate it as angel. But when the exact same word is clearly being an individual, a human sending another human, we translate it as messenger. And that communicates, hey, this is just another human being sent. 
So let's look at some text here. Luke 9, 51 and 52. Now it came to pass, when the time had come for him to be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. He sent messengers before his face. Now this is Jesus, and he's sending messengers, so who did he probably send? Disciples. He sent someone, he sent another human being, but it's the exact same word as angel. It is one who was sent. It is a messenger. In Matthew 11.10, Mark 1.2, and Luke 7.27, each time referring to John the Baptist, it's the exact same word, but it's translated messenger instead of angel. Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. Simply one who is sent. Luke 7.24, the first part, says the same thing. When the messengers of John had departed, he began to speak of the multitudes concerning John. This is Jesus speaking about John. But you see, the messengers of John, just some guys or girls, someone that John said, hey, go talk to Jesus. I have some questions. Again, same exact word translated either angel or messenger, depending on if the being is from here or if the being is from heaven. So, Matthew 28, 19, you remember the Great Commission, the Gospel Commission, that after Jesus has left the manger and grown and worked, and he's, he's not quite to Calvary as he's teaching his people how to go, then he comes to Calvary, and after Calvary, all power is given to him. And what does he do with all of his messengers? Commissions them. Go. He sends his disciples out to tell the good news of salvation. Friends, when's the last time that you ever thought of yourself as an angel of God? a messenger of God. It's the exact same word. But friends, if there are still shepherds and if the night is still dark and the message is still a message of joy for all mankind, we certainly need angels today. We certainly need your voice, your picture of God that you've seen, shared with your circle of influence. You are the messenger of God to that group. Your picture of a loving, merciful, kind, and gracious God who wants to save, not sentence. Who wants to redeem, not judge. Is the very message they need to hear. They are your shepherds and you are the angel for God. The pictures we've looked at, the little glimpses in Scripture, are not by any means all of the good news, but we've looked at some good news today. Because they are eagerly waiting to hear good news in a year like this year. And what better time than the holiday season when the, the thoughts turn to the birth of Christ than to share among our circle of influence. So what are some next steps? What are some things we could do? First, could I suggest that we reacquaint ourselves with the biblical picture of God? Friends, in talking with my friends, I understand that so often when Christians today say, you need to believe in Jesus, the picture of Jesus that the world has been taught is of a God who will torture you forever in hellfire. And so it comes across from our side when we know that God is gracious and merciful, loving and kind, we think we're saying something invitational and hopeful, but what they're hearing because of the picture of God they've been taught is really something much more frightening. Hey, you need to believe in this guy because if you don't, he's going to torture you to death forever. And that's not a message of hope for all mankind. The biblical picture of God, the one that we can capture again, is probably the place we need to start nowadays. A God of love and grace, mercy and kindness. Before we ever invite them to follow him, we may have to make sure they understand that the person we're about to invite them to follow is not the person they've been told about. That Genesis opens and Revelation closes with a perfect world with nothing harmful in it and no pain and no suffering and no death. And that the God who, who wants to create and recreate is a God of love who doesn't want any suffering and will not allow any suffering in his recreated kingdom. It will be a place of joy and happiness and laughter and relationships for eternity. So we may have to reacquaint ourselves with the biblical picture of God first 
in order to share the right picture of God when we start talking to people. Second, could we pray that God will help us to see who to share with? Friends, those little shepherds, in quotations, in your circle of influence, are longing for hope. They want to know that there is something more, something better, something, something beyond this mess that we currently live in. And you know it. You've seen it. You've had glimpses of it. Your journey is different than mine. You've seen different pictures of God. He's answered different prayers for you than he has for me. And you can share those pictures with someone. And they will find hope. Do you think that those shepherds, when they woke up that morning, had on their calendar, will be seen by heavenly messengers today, will run off and tell the world about God? I don't think that's how their daykeeper looked. I think it was much more... Here we go again, back out into the field, stupid sheep. Well, oh, wait, I love the sheep. Sorry, I have a good job. They were just doing their job. And heaven interrupted. And the rest of their life would never be the same. Friends, how many of your little shepherds would love to have their life interrupted by the hope you currently have so that their lives could never be the same? Whether you're younger or older, your voice is important. And God wants to work through you in your circle of influence. Finally, could you present God as truly good tidings of great joy to all people? Friends, God's gift of Jesus was for every man and every woman. Sometimes we're tempted to think, Hey, let's just talk to the other Christians. Let's just talk to the other denominations. Let's just talk to the people that already know. Let's just talk to the people that are comfortable to talk with. But that angelic message was good tidings of great joy to all people, especially the broken, especially the hurting, especially the addicted, especially those who are suffering. That message is one they need even more than those other people we're more comfortable with. Could we this season, as we reacquaint ourselves with that biblical picture and as we pray for people to be led to, could we then present God as something exciting, something that would be self-recommending? You want to visit God. You want to talk to Him. He wants to restore you and heal you. He wants to give you a beautiful future. Can we present that picture of God, a winning picture of God, this holiday season? Friends, you are the messengers of God to this generation in your circle of influence. You don't have to worry about preaching to the masses or or being someone huge and famous. You're already famous where God needs you to be. If he has more for you, he'll lead you there. But right now, he has you in your circle of influence. And you can reach them in ways that no evangelist ever will be able to. Your voice is important. Your voice is needed. And you are the angelic messenger for the shepherds in your circle of influence. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, thank you for the reminder that we are loved. Thank you for the reminder that Jesus was a gift because of that love. Father, thank you for the reminder that It is truly good tidings of great joy for all people. Lord, could you help help us capture that biblical picture of a, a loving God with arms open wide trying to redeem everyone? Could you help us be excited about it so that our voice isn't just meh? Could you help us be enthusiastic about Jesus? His love, his grace, his mercy, and his invitation to life Light in darkness. Father, thank you for a holiday season in which our thoughts are drawn back to your gift. Please help us to take that gift into the lives of someone else this holiday season and give it freely, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.